Hello guys, this is Val from Core Conservation and this video is about the working principle of the magnetic DPC, a very very much requested topic. I'm going to use this time a laptop because there's a lot of information I need to go through and I want to make sure I'm staying on track. I'm going to take a look at the screen from time to time just to make sure everything is put in the right order. In the first part of this video, I'm trying to give you a quick overview and background of this technology, answering some of the questions that have been out there for a while, but never been answered before. Solving rising damp non-invasively using magnetic or electromagnetic fields have been attempted by several companies or technologies. Yet, none of these solutions really became mainstream or a new standard in the building sector, but kind of drifted to the side as a curiosum, despite of the empirical evidence, which means observation or practical evidence, that these indeed work. Based on my observation and experience, this can be attributed to one of the following three factors. One, lack of research and published information. I think we can agree that at best there is limited information available on these technologies. Some of these systems are protected by patent protection, while some others are not. Not patenting an invention in itself is a defense or protection mechanism, because by patenting something you need to put out a lot of information in the public domain, opening the door to copying. This is not new practice to the building industry, because, for example, plaster manufacturers often follow the same principle by not patenting their formulas, but instead keeping them as a trade secret. A comment on research. Any research in this wireless building dehydration technology requires a very specific skill set. An inventor or developer in this field has to be knowledgeable not only in building materials or the movement of moisture in porous building materials, but on electronics too, especially microwaves or microwave technologies, a highly technical and specialized field of electronics. People with such skill set are very rare. Two, current limitations of scientific understanding. A lot of molecular phenomena is still not clearly understood by science today, despite of all the advancements. Let's look at the concept of a field, any field, electrical or magnetic field. We all know these exist. There is no further proof needed about their existence. However, quite interestingly, science doesn't know what the anatomy of a field is, how they are created, what they are made of, are they particles or waves, which obviously, to some extent, limits our current understanding on their effects and what can they do. And third, lastly, misinformation. Being a new technology requiring a rare and special skill set, research initially is understandably scarce. In addition to this, however, some companies have also published incorrect information. In some cases, these are not even in agreement with physics or mainstream science. The conflicting data by itself has discouraged virtually any third-party academic research in this field, pushing back awareness of this technology on professional lines by at least 15 years, causing this technology not to be taken seriously. I was fortunate enough to meet one of the early developers of this technology an electronic radio engineer who dealt with this subject for half of his lifetime, for well over 20 years, and knows this subject inside out. Several generations of these systems have been developed over the years as this technology matured. The technical development is still ongoing and some really exciting new products are on their way, which are we going to disclose in due course. We try to take advantage of technical developments and use technology to its best to give faster and better results to our customers. 
As an independent British company, we indeed have been licensed distributors of the Aquapole systems for over five years. However, currently, we are distributing a newer generation of these systems marketed under the Renault Dry brand. Despite of the interest and some questions out there, I'm not going to comment here how these other systems work, whether we have been distributing them in the past or not, because from a legal viewpoint, I'm not allowed to comment on them, nor to make qualifying statements or comparisons between them. What is important, we are in this business for the long haul, and we fully support every magnetic DPC installation in the UK, regardless of their brand. So all guarantees are fully intact. With this video, I want to cover the working principle of our current units, what we know about them, how they work, while also highlighting as we go along some of the areas that are not fully understood and need further research. Hope you find this information useful and answers some of your questions and dispels some of the lies and myths out there. I have divided the video into four sections. One, waves, the basic of waves. I'm also going to discuss earth magnetic field in this section. Two, antennas, some basic information on antennas. Because fundamentally our magnetic DPC system is a system of antennas. Three, how magnetic or electromagnetic waves affect our buildings and generally porous building materials and the movement of moisture in porous building materials. This is brand new information. I'm not aware of any other company before publishing information along these lines the way I'm doing it here. Four, putting it all together, the working principle, while also addressing openly some of the questions about it. For better understanding, I strongly advise you to watch the whole video as the concepts are gradually built on top of each other. So, let's get started. 1. Waves Any wave is a vibration, is something which is changing in time. It can be a sound wave, an electromagnetic wave, light is also a wave, and the various colors of the visible spectrums are waves of different wavelength. Some of the important properties of any wave is its frequency, and its wavelength. Frequency shows the rate of change or the speed of change of vibration, how quickly it changes. One change per second means one hertz, hertz being the measurement unit of frequency. A 10 hertz vibration changes 10 times a second. Also, we speak about higher frequency waves like one megahertz, which means one million changes a second, one gigahertz, one billion changes a second. But also on the lower part of the scale, we can have very, very slowly changing waves, which change about, let's say, one millihertz wave changes in 10 seconds. So it's very slow and makes a change in 10 seconds. And this is called a millihertz wave or an ultra low frequency wave. Wavelength. Wavelengths are the opposite of frequency. They show how much distance a wave travels between two consecutive oscillations. What is important, there are unlimited wavelengths out there, starting from very, very low frequency to going way, way high up. And here is a radiation chart, a quick graphical overview of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. On the left hand side, the lower frequency starting from 0 Hz and going towards the right towards the very, very high frequencies. As you can see on the left hand side, we have the static electric and magnetic fields and some low frequency electric and magnetic field. Then most of the spectrum around the center is about the radio frequency band starting with TV and radio broadcast, mobile phones, microwave and satellite signals. Then we get into the visible light and ultraviolet band. Then on the top end of the spectrum we have X-rays and radioactive sources, including cosmic radiation. 
Let's have a chat about Earth magnetic field. We have a magnetic DPC. The reason why it's called magnetic DPC because it uses magnetic fields. And where the magnetic field is coming from? From around Earth magnetic field. And this information is not very well known, but keep it simple. Earth magnetic field has two components. We have a fixed component and a variable component. The fixed component of the magnetic field or the static magnetic field is believed, again, not 100% sure, is believed to be generated by rotating currents inside the molten core. Difference of temperatures in the core of the Earth will make the lava rotate and this will generate a magnetic field. It is also known as the dynamo effect. This magnetic field is highly static in nature. There are, ver there are variations over long distances and they are also has a, a very, very slowly varying over time. So typically every five years, these magnetic field charts are updated. But for all intents and purposes, it's a static field. The dynamic component of the magnetic field originates from the sun. The sun outermost region, the corona, which is a hot plasma field surrounding the sun, which reaches over 1 million degrees Celsius, constantly emits rapidly moving particles in form of light, heat, radio waves, X-rays in every direction. This is known as the solar wind. This occurs every single day, non-stop. And in addition to this relatively peaceful solar radiation, there are a few explosive effects which also affect Earth. And these ex the two main drivers are the solar flares, which are sudden short bursts of energy that travel at the speed of light, and then coronal mass ejections, which are very large, the most powerful explosions on the surface of the sun that release billions of tons of magnetic plasma into the surrounding space towards Earth sometimes, affecting everything around. The combined effect of these solar eruptions are called geomagnetic disturbances. Geo refers to Earth, magnetic because it's magnetic in nature. So all this magnetized plasma being spitted towards Earth, obviously is going to affect Earth magnetic field. And it's going to disrupt Earth magnetic field, creating smaller or larger variations in time which, by the way, can be divided, depending on their size and intensity and duration, into three areas. One, the smallest changes are called magnetic pulsations. These are small, continuous variations of the magnetic field. They occur non-stop, a bit similar like the wind outside. You get a bit of wind blowing this way, blowing that way. There's always a bit of change, or most of the time. Same way magnetic pulsations they always change. Substorms, these are larger variations lasting for two to four hours and they occur several times a day. And finally, storms, geomagnetic storms, which by the way are heavily pushed, dictated by the solar flares and coronal mass ejections, these big explosions on the surface of the sun which can reach Earth within minutes or within hours. These are the largest disturbances, these geomagnetic storms, a very large changes in Earth magnetic fields that can last from several hours to several days. And these natural eruptions not only affect the planet's magnetic field kind, of field, kind of squashing on the day side and elongating Earth magnetic field on the night side, making it look like from outer space, like a comet with a long, long tail toward the night side and squashed on the day side, but they can also significantly affect a lot of human technologies, really seriously. And here are some examples. This can make serious damages to telecommunication satellites out there in space, because the sensitive circuitry is particularly vulnerable to space weather effects, resulting in radiation damage, electrical discharges, or component failure. Radio 
telecommunications or radar outages are another field which can be created by these explosions, changes, heavy changes of the magnetic field. For example, the solar radio bursts can interfere with man-made weak radio signals on the day side of the Earth, such as GPS navigation systems or satnav si si uh, signals or reflected radar signals. And as a result, it can re these signals, these man-made signals can be completely overshadowed, resulting in loss of aircraft position or complete communication blackouts. You just can't communicate. And there are many, many of the examples of these. It also can result in power outages. Geomagnetic storms can induce large currents in suspended high voltage power lines. We have these big masts with long, long power lines. Changing magnetic field can induce significant currents and this can result in the overheating, overload or potential failure of transformers, resulting in certain cases in the complete collapse of the electrical grid. It happened before, it happened several times. One example in March 1989 in Quebec, Canada, a massive geomagnetic storm collapsed the Canadian electrical grid within seconds, resulting in 6 million people left without power for one or two days. This is all on the internet. One more effect of these uh, magnetic storms are corrosion of pipelines, of the underground pipelines through gas or, or, um, or oil. These are, made, these are again long conductors, very long underground conductors, and the changing magnetic field can induce serious currents into the body of the conductor. Uh, in addition to anti-corrosion coating, these are also coated electronically, uh, sorry, these are also protected electronically by a small negative voltage against the ground, and these induced currents can shift these voltages, resulting in much faster corrosion and as a result, resulting in a much shorter life span of these pipelines. Rail system problems. Geomagnetically induced currents can create uh, currents in the long rail tracks, which can interfere with control signals, the control circuitry, and several cases have been documented where lines have been changed from green to red, and this is a serious concern, especially with the growth of high-speed trains. It's a health and safety, it's a safety issue. And finally, coming down from outer space and to the conductors and everything coming down into the ground, these storms and substorms can drive large magnetic variations that can penetrate hundreds of miles into the solid body of Earth. And some of these can affect the houses and we are going to discuss these later. At the end, a quick summary of what we have discussed so far. Basically, we have the sun, we have these explosions on the surface of the sun, which drive massive magnetic plasmas and massive effects towards Earth. And this massive energy cascades down through various layers towards the surface of the Earth, resulting in a number of effects. The solar activity and various variations of the magnetic field are constantly monitored by the governments worldwide, by government and scientific agencies. Just search on the internet geomagnetic disturbances or space weather activity and you find tons of data on this. Now, the devices or the technology that can pick up, receive or transmit electromagnetic wavelength are called antennas. And next, we are going to cover briefly some of the basics of antennas because our magnetic DPC system, as mentioned earlier, are fundamentally antennas. So, antennas. What is an antenna? In their simplest form, an antenna is a piece of wire or conductor. Most of them are made of copper or aluminium because they conduct electricity. However, other materials can also be used to make antennas. What is their working principle? Very, very simply. Fundamentally, an antenna is a metallic conductor exposed to a variable field, electrical or magnetic field. Now, we discussed the waves before, what a wave is. A bunch of waves creates a field, and changing waves create a changing field. 
The changing field induces or creates a current and voltage inside the conductive body of an antenna. The current is collected and taken, for example, to the TV, to the mobile phone, or anywhere else for further amplification and processing. And although there are an infinite number of wavelengths out there, as discussed, one particular antenna only reacts to or collects selectively one type of wave, only those waves which match its length. Everything else is pretty much ignored. What this means? If this is an antenna, and the length of this let's say is 200 millimeters, about 20 centimeters, if this would be part of a TV antenna sitting on your, on your rooftop, it would only pick up those wavelengths of which only those waves of which wavelength is matching the length of the antenna. In this is 20 centimeter, the 20 centimeter waves, which is about 1.5 gigahertz or something along those lines. So everything else, longer wavelength or shorter wavelength are going to be ignored. Just to keep it simple. Simplest antennas are made of one single element. Then you have a wire in the center, actually it's cut in two pieces. You have half of, of an antenna on the left-hand side, half on the right. You have a wire, it's called a simple dipole antenna. And this can go to the TV or to the, to the radio for further amplification. However, other antennas are made of several, like a TV antenna, are made of several elements, maybe 10, 15 elements to get uh, larger amplification Even and several that? antennas can be combined into antenna systems or arrays of antennas to get a better performance. One of the most important properties of an antenna is called directivity. Directivity, directivity basically shows from which direction antennas can pick up signal. I'm going to again use this tool here. If this is an antenna, and we have a wire which takes the signal to amplification. Um, in order to pick up the signal, the antenna has to be oriented towards the mast. So if the camera would be the signal source, then the antenna must be oriented perpendicular to the propagation line. Otherwise, if we, we orient the antenna this way, or that way, or this way, and so on, you're not going to get optimal reception. So directivity shows from which way the antenna can pick up signal. Um, now, there are many types of antennas out there. We can find antennas which, uh, which are very, very uh, directive, which means that they only pick up signal from one direction or maybe two directions. However, there are also antennas which are called omnidirectional, which pick up energy from all around. Now, which one is better? There's no good answer which one is better. It depends on where you want to use it. For example, for a TV antenna, you want a highly directional antenna because you want to, to pick up the BBC One signal in its best quality and you want to suppress anything else, all the other interfering waves. You want a directional antenna. However, for example, when you are on an airport, and you are interested where the planes are coming from, you want that you look around the airport or maybe have a rotating antenna like a radar antenna, then you want some sort of omnidirectional or an antenna which can see in every direction, not only in one direction. So there are many, many types of antennas and they have been many of them have been developed over time. I'm going to just cover two of them very, very briefly. And one of them is called a spiral antenna. Now, a spiral antenna, is these are the antennas what our systems use. And as the name says, it's a spiral. So I'm going to show you one here. Here is basically a spiral antenna. You can see that on the, it's, a, it's like a noodle. It's a, circular, it's a circular type of antenna. And because it doesn't have any per particular uh, in, uh, uh, sense, it, will pick up, it can pick up signals from anywhere. Now, these type of antennas are very, very wide band. They are also called frequency independent or omnidirectional antennas. And uh, these have been discovered in, 19, in the 1950s, around 1953, and various developments have occurred. And here I show you just a, a technical paper, which covers some of, some of the basics. It has been published by the University of, of Illinois, 
and it's an overview, a survey of the very wide band of frequency independent antennas between 1945 to present. And by present, if you look at the date, it's 1961, it's post-war. Um, and this covers the uh, brief history of these antennas. In 1953, the first spiral antenna had been proposed or created called Archimedes Spiral. And then it has been further improved in 1954, then in 1957 patented, which have expired since then. For example, the logarithmic periodic antenna, it has like an increasing pitch rather than being like a noodle. It is increasing as we go outside. Here's a picture of that. And then they created various three-dimensional antennas. So it's a whole theory. And these type of antennas are mainly used in uh, in GPS systems, radar systems, high frequency, where you need to have a very, very high um, wide wavelength, uh, wide band, and you want a universal response, maybe you want high quality applications, put it this way simply. The other type of antenna which I wanted to cover, it's a very, very special one. It call, is called the seawater antenna. It's relevant as we are going to see it uh, shortly. These type of antennas, they do not use metal elements as like we use this here, made of copper or, or, um, or steel or anything like that, or aluminium, but they use seawater as the element to receive and transmit. Seawater, it's electrically conductive, so technically it could be used as an antenna. Here's the seawater antenna or electrolytic fluid antenna. It's an American patent filed in 2011. It's a very interesting concept. The antenna is made of a pump and this basically creates a jet of seawater in order to receive and transmit signals. The conductive jet acts as an antenna to transmit and receive signals. It's very loud and clear and uh, no noise on the background. Okay, thank you for your help. What is interesting, Mitsubishi? The Japanese company created a working prototype in a fish tank showing the concept live and uh, we can see that in the fish tank we have a, a water stream and this acts as the antenna showing the reception of TV signals and this can be found on the internet from ngadget.com 2016 website. That's all about antennas and we go to the next section, how electromagnetic waves affect your buildings and walls and what is their effect. As mentioned earlier, this is brand new information to the building industry. I'm not aware of any scientific publication going into this to such depth. I am aware of some publications which discuss some of these related phenomena However, not the way I'm presenting here. Generally speaking, very little research has been done in this field, in the building field, about what is the effect of electromagnetic waves onto the building structure, what is the relationship to rising damp. However, I hope that more research will be on, underway. We are definitely doing some research, we have some ongoing research, and I hope other organizations are going to follow suit. Let's start with the flow of energy, something which has been presented before earlier. The flow of energy from the sun towards the surface of the earth, through the various echelons, various layers of earth, magnetosphere, ionosphere, the ozone layer, atmosphere, and so on, coming from all the way up from outer space, affecting the magnetic field and also affecting the soil. Now, because our houses are built on the soil, on earth, in solid electrical contact, on earth, we can say that every building is an extension of the surface. And from here is probably not a far-fetched idea that if we have a number of electronic phenomena affecting the soil or affecting the areas under the soil, it could have some effect on our buildings. And what is interesting, I came across a research paper, a scientific paper, which identified at least 32 different mechanisms that can cause earth currents or electrical effects in the ground 
These can affect the soil, the buildings and the various wall structures. I'm going to put this up onto the, onto the screen. Here it is, Earth Electricity, a review of mechanisms which cause telluric currents in the lithosphere. Telluric currents means earth currents, just Latin words, means earth current, and the lithosphere refers to the outer crust of the soil. So this research paper is about various electrical mechanisms which cause earth currents, various electrical currents, near the crust or on the surface of Earth. California State University Long Beach, Department of Geological Sciences, covering topics such as magnetosphere, magnetic storms, mineral physics and properties of rocks, uh, magnetic and elect electrical metals, geology, space sciences, and so on and so on. So it's basically it's a geological um, paper. And uh, as you can see here, it says 32 distinct mechanisms have been found that cause Earth electricity. And these are discussed in detail in the paper. I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through all 32 because I want to keep it really simple. But it's worth showing that here are all 32 of them. And uh, these, are show, these are classified into space phenomena, atmospheric phenomena, oceanic phenomena, surface, groundwater, other terrestrial or deep terrestrial phenomena. And as you can see, we have here, it describes the cause, what can cause lightning or cosmic nature or weather or volcanic nature. It shows the cycle, how often they occur, 11 every, every 24 hours or 28 days, or a lot of things are unknown, shows not known. And also the mechanism, for example, it creates electromagnetic induction or charge transmission and so on and so on. And as you can see, quite a few things here are unknown and still uh, subject to future research. Of these, I'm just going to cover a few of them which I think are very, very relevant to what we discuss here. And the reason I also wanted to cover this just to show you that these phenomena exist. Chances are, if you ask your architect or building professional, or you are an architect or a building professional, you haven't heard about these or not in this context. So it's quite interesting. I'm going to go over about seven of them, I think I have uh, handpicked of the 32, just to give an overview that these exist and yes, they can affect the buildings, the walls, and yes, they have a connection to rising damp. One of them would be, the first one would be the geomagnetically induced currents. As mentioned earlier, geomagnetic storms, these heavy explosions from the sun, then they create changes in the magnetic field, which by the way, can create various currents under the surface which are responsible for the, for the corrosion of pipelines and various rail circuit problems. These are talking about quite heavy currents, about 200 amperes, which are actually migrating, moving back and forth uh, under, the, un, under the ground. Lightning strikes. Guess what? Lightning strikes generate very low frequency electromagnetic waves that propagate al along the magnetic field lines with extremely low, very, very low attenuation, and they can travel several times across the globe, bouncing back and forth inside uh, the ionosphere, which is the higher part of the atmosphere, which is magnetic, and just these wavelengths just bounce back and forth. And the famous Schumann resonances are believed to be created by the lightning activity. Other thing is storm charging. Storm clouds, when it rains, they create a vertical electrical field. The electric current will flow from the cloud towards the surface of the Earth. And quite interestingly, according to research, 96% of the total electricity of a thunderstorm is going to be discharged through the storm charging and only 4% through the lightnings as direct discharge energy flow. Isn't that interesting? Now, we also have a number of various effects, electrochemical, electrokinetic, thermoelectric, and seismoelectric effects. These are all various electrical effects on molecular level, which occur inside the ground, inside the walls, or near the surface. Just to give a very quick, quick overview, electrochemical, electrochemical effects, when salty water travels in porous building materials, an electrical current is created by the movement 
of the charged salt ions. And this is a battery effect, fundamentally. Electrokinetic effects, they are very, very important. I'm not going to go into these, but basically they have to do with the movement of a fluid against the capillary walls. We have a capillary wall, we have the fluid as part of the rising lamp moving along the capillary walls, and it will create various electronic phenomena. Thermoelectric effects, they show that temperature differences between the two ends of the capillary, so you start heating one of, uh, let's say, the walls, you have the bottom of the capillary is cold, the top of the capillary is warm, the change, this temperature difference will change a DC, will create a DC voltage of a few millivolts with a negative charge or negative pole at the cold end and the positive charge at the upper, the warm end. And finally, the seismoelectric effects, these have to do with vibrations, seismic vibrations, and various atmospheric phenomena, for example, wind or the flow of the river, which creates pulsations, ocean waves, or nearby human activities, such as traffic, heavy machinery, industrial works, trucks, and everything else, they generate persistent low-frequency vibrations on the ground, which can move the water, create seismic vibration, resulting in localized electrical fields. And again, my intention was not to go deeply into them, but just to give an idea that these are there and exist. Now, what is the relation of all these electrical ground phenomena, as well as electrical atmospheric phenomena from higher or lower parts of the atmosphere with your walls? It is an interesting one. Wall capillaries are filled with water, some of them. Some of them are empty and just the air moves through them, but some capillaries, especially the ones which are closer to the ground or for very old buildings, they are filled with salty water, partially or fully. And as mentioned earlier with the seawater antennas, these capillaries act as tiny miniature antennas and the height of the water column inside the capillaries determines the frequency they pick up from the airwaves. And as the capillaries, the water moves inside the capillaries, they become sensitive to various frequencies from the environment. And we can see it here on the screen that this way, the wall can be approximated or can be regarded as a complex antenna network because we have billions of capillaries, many of them filled with water up to a certain point, some of them just at the bottom, some of them much higher, and they start reacting to a bunch of frequencies. As a result, ongoing energy transfer will occur from the environment due to changing magnetic electromagnetic fields and the wall. And this will keep the walls in a permanently charged up state. It's just going to keep and it's going to keep it excited, excited, and charged up, and charged up. Very, very similar, you have a TV antenna and picks up the TV signal on an ongoing basis. We have your walls here, or we have these walls here in the back, and it will keep exciting the walls. If we analyze one capillary, and let's say, this is a cup, but let's say this is a capillary. It's a silicate surface, which is a, made of sand. We have a capillary, the reason why water actually rises, guess what, it's surprise, surprise, it rises because of electrical phenomena. Keeping it very, very shortly, we have a brick, brick is a silica material, and it has a negative surface charge, and the water molecules, H2, has a positive and negative end. What is important, the water has a positive end, and the positive end is going to be attracted to the negative wall surface, and this will contribute to the capillary action. We have this capillary, we have the waves out there, the magnetic or electromagnetic waves charging up the wall on an ongoing basis, and this will do something to the surface of this, um, of this capillary. It will charge it up most likely to an effect and it will create some lifting forces. The mechanism is not fully understood because again it has to do with the fields which we don't know exactly what they do but it will create some lifting forces which will move the water upwards inside the capillary. What is interesting, if somehow we, uh, obviously if we somehow we could stop this incoming energy, this 
incoming effect onto the wall so the water is basically is not coming in or the or the or these wavelengths are not come are not coming in hitting uh, hitting the surface quite interestingly then this whole excitation uh, electrical charge business will stop and the whole wall because it's linked to the ground it will discharge and gravity will pull the water column out of the building these findings open the door to new handling of rising damp. Final chapter, fourth, what is a magnetic DPC? How does it work? What is its working principle? Kind of putting it all together. What is important? A magnetic DPC addresses the core of the problem. It will not kind of beat around the bush and will handle this and handle that. No, it will go to the core of the problem, to the very, very essence of the problem. It, it will hit the capillaries in a sensitive area inside where it bonds to the wall and reverses the phenomenon. So basically, as long as you have a magnetic DPC in the building, the building will not only dry out in the initial phase, let's say it takes about a year or so, but as long as it's kept on the build, in the building, the building will stay permanently dry. We have tested it. I'm going to cover some of these, these, uh, these things later. So, how does it work? We have the capillary and we have all these wavelengths out there, yeah, hitting the walls from left, right, center, of, from all sorts of wavelengths. By observation and practical experiments have demonstrated that only a handful, certain wavelengths, are going to affect the walls in a way, or charge up the walls, which will result in the draw up of the water. The rest of these frequencies, they are harmless from this viewpoint. We call these critical frequencies. And these critical frequencies are, a handful of them, a number of them, which will make the water move upwards inside the capillaries. So obviously, if we can somehow, we have been postulating that if we somehow can take this out of the equation and discharge them or nullify them, then they are not going to charge up the wall and then the wall, the wall is going to be discharged and the water goes back into the ground. And that's exactly what happens. Let's see the construction of the unit, what these units are made of. The unit is made of three, four major components. One of them would be the case. The primary role of the case is not decorative, but a functional one. So it has been designed to be functional rather than nice. The case is made of hypuric aluminium, which is a paramagnetic material. It's not steel, so it will not uh, shield magnetic fields. For example, if you take an aluminium case and a ball bearing, as you can see here, it will move. So magnetic fields can penetrate aluminium and also the compass will work inside an aluminium case. If the case would be made of steel, then that would completely filter out everything and you would have a completely shielded environment. Uh, going to the circuits inside, we can see that there are three circuits in the unit. There's a top circuit, a central and bottom circuit. The top circuit, which is shown here, is an energy intake circuit. Energy comes in, and uh, is collected by these antennas and the variable magnetic fields will create voltages and currents in the metallic conducting body of the arms of the spiral antenna. And the signal will be collected in the center and then transferred through a hardwire, a hardwire connection to the bottom one or two uh, filtering circuits. Some units come with one filtering circuit some others with two filtering circuits. The additional filtering circuit expands the frequency band of the unit, making it perform even better as part of the ongoing technical innovation. Some of the larger units have additional components, but I just want to show the concept of a simpler unit so you understand what they do. The filtering circuit is a bandpass circuit, which means it will let through everything, the whole frequency band, it will let it pass unaffected except the critical frequencies onto which this have been tuned into. And these critical frequencies, as you can imagine, which they depend on the construction 
of these spiral antennas, how they have been put together. And these critical frequencies are the critical frequencies which mess up our walls. So this being a bandpass filter, the signal will go through without being affected except those uh, critical frequencies which are going to be short-circuited. The case, by the way, is earthed, so the, short, the, the frequencies are going to be short-circuited and fundamentally this unit is nothing else than an elevated earth point. The unit is in a case and is going to go up onto the, onto the ceiling, somewhere inside the building, so it means that the signal which is collected from the airwaves uh, by the unit is going to be short-circuited rather than going to the walls. I'm going to illustrate the concept with a lightning protection system or a lightning circuit. As you can see on the screen, a lightning protection system is also an earth point. All we need just a strong conductor which comes down on the side of the house and is earthed. And the primary role of an earthing circuit or a um, lightning protection circuit is not to get the heat and channel the heat away. It can do that, but very often it's destroyed by the 100,000 amperes. But the primary reason is actually just to take some of the potential from the uh, rain clouds by the storm clouds and channel it down so it will prevent the problem from occurring rather than dealing with the problem. And if it does a good job, then this static charge, which we're talking about the storm charging earlier, this will go into the ground and uh, lightning strike will not occur in the, in, in, in the area of the house. And this way, how it protects. Um, same way, our unit, if it's not in the building, then uh, these waves will go into the wall, will charge up the walls, and they will short circuit themselves through the walls. However, if we provide an elevated earth point in the building, then we start collecting, pulling the signals from, from the building, and those will not reach the walls. The concept, again, works very, very similarly. If you think about the drainage or the French drain, let's think about, let's we have a house here, and we have a, a soil under us, and we have a water table. And the water, let's assume that the water is kind of uniformly spread under the house. And then we go and take a shovel and we're going to dig a hole or a channel, a French drain, on the side. By digging a hole, we create a lower energy point and by opening a deeper hole, water starts flowing because in nature everything flows, everything moves from high energy to lower energy. This is a generic principle. Rivers, for example, flow from the top of the mountain towards the sea. Or electrical circuits, in case of electrical circuits, everything, all currents flow from the higher potential towards the lower potential or ground, because everything wants to stabilize at the lowest point of energy. Same way, once we have a drainage point, then the water table will start moving because it's a void and it starts pulling in the extra pressure from high pressure to low pressure in nature, when we have uh, higher pressure and lower pressure areas, guess what? The wind will start blowing and changes in pressure will start pulling the winds and you start having movement, uh, movement in nature. And uh, same way occurs with these magnetic fields. Again, we don't know exactly what a field is, but, and we cannot see them, but once we put an, an earth point up there, it will open and it starts collecting, similar, uh, similar with the uh, lightning protection system, it will start collecting and it will earth it. As a result, these critical frequencies, frequencies which are filtered out and short-circuited by the filtering mechanism, it will, uh, it will give a break to the wall. The walls are not going to be affected, they are going to be affected less and less and less. Their effect is going to be less and less, the walls start charging uh, discharging naturally and as a result this combination of electronic phenomena is going to become less and less gravity wins and the water columns start going back into the ground what is interesting we have done many many studies and ma uh, many many uh, many many practical studies 
and uh, once the magnetic DTC gets into the building, it will uh, the problem will uh, go away. We fit the unit and without anything else being done to the building, the building will start drying out. Um, when I mentioned this to some of the professionals, they were some of them were very, very skeptical and they said, no, 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 it cannot be hap it cannot happen. There must have been some other cause. And it's fair, you know, if you are talking about an external wall, you know, which is subject to rain and subject to wind and subject to sun and a bunch of other things, obviously multiple causes are operating on the wall. However, you can find many, many buildings or certain a certain number of buildings where the problem was in exclusively on the internal walls not subject to condensation because it's constant temperature, it is not subject to rainwater, it's not subject to leaks, and the problem is at the bottom of the wall. So obviously it is, has to, the problem is coming from the ground. And in these cases, we fit the magnetic DTC system in the building and the whole thing has cleared without any issue, without anything else being done to the building. So the practical observations are very, very many. And we have tested these magnetic DPC systems bit on a lot of buildings, starting probably from buildings from the 1940s, as young as about 60, 70 year old buildings from the 90s, 40s, 30s, 50s, going back to the Victorian period, uh, Tudor period, medieval ages, four or five hundred year old cottage or commercial buildings, and even in churches which are nearly or about a thousand years or so, uh, have been tested on single skin bricks have been tested on thick um, stone buildings uh, with rubble infill or a massive one, one, a, one and a half meter thick solid church walls which were really really old and really really damp and they worked invariably in every single case without exception, without fail, 100% of the time. It's very very simply to install, it's very very simply to monitor. What we normally do, we fit one of these systems in the building and then we take drilled core measurements from the wall because according to Historic England and various textbooks, these are the most accurate measurements. Electronic multimeters, they give you a good indication how the wall is behaving, even if you take, uh, and, and we are not talking about pin prong meters, but we are talking about more sophisticated capacitance or microwave based meters, which we have been using probably for about four or five years now on a regular basis, consistent basis. And though these show, a uh, these are a good diagnosis tool for long-term measurements, the drill core measurements are the more, uh, the best suited because these measurements with these, we can actually take very, very well defined readings from the core of the wall from 50, 100, 150, 200 millimeters deep, while an electronic multimeter just gives you an overview, an average of from the surface towards its penetration damp, and you cannot be selective in depth. So we have taken a lot of professional readings before and on a regular basis, 6, 12, 18, 24 months or two years uh, of the buildings and invariably we saw a decrease in the moisture content without anything else being done to the building. Uh, this is quite interesting uh, because the values can be traced quite easily and some of the things what we have found is that even in the cases which really puzzles, where I would use a word sometimes upsets cons conservation professionals and they just can't conceive the idea, grasp the, grasp the idea, because it goes against everything they have been taught during, during their lifetimes and the schooling and everything else, that if you have a non-breathable surface, for example, you have a concrete or cement surface, which obviously ideally should be removed. But there are certain cases when you cannot remove them because it can damage the building or they are too expensive, there are no funds and so on and so on. And in these cases, when we apply the magnetic DPC and we leave the cement there, and we don't put any drainage in because it's not possible for various reasons. So there are some really hardcore cases, the moisture levels still drop inside the building invariably every single time. Obviously, if you take the cement off and you put drainage on and you start working on different parameters of the building and you apply the magnetic DPC, it's going to actually work faster because you are hitting the problem from many, many angles. But what is interesting, you put the magnetic DPC and you're not doing any of these things, and I'm not telling you not to do it, do it when you can, but if you cannot do it and you're not doing it, the building will still dry out or it will, it will still significantly improve.
depending on various parameters. Some of the questions which uh, I would like to go over here at the very, very end, it's a quite long video, is what is the effect of these systems on human health? What it will do to humans or pets or living organisms? And in a very, very short answer to this, really nothing. Because the units are not powered, they do not emit any fields. They do not emit anything. It's one of these very, very few technologies that do not emit harmful radiations. It's a passive antenna system, which rather than emitting things and overcoming things, it will collect and burn out and dissipate. It will collect everything which comes out from the environment, the energy signature of the building, but only will affect those frequencies which are the critical frequencies on which the, the circuit has been tuned and everything else will just flow through without any, uh, without any effect. I did not go into the technical description how these filtering circuits work because I think it's too technical. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this or I'm happy to maybe put a follow-up video if there's a need for it. How do they work internally? But at the moment, keep it simple, it will filter out. So it, it cannot damage humans and it will not damage humans. You can ask the same question, what, how much your sky aerial on the wall is going to damage the building? Or how much your TV antenna or how much your lightning protection rod on the roof is going to damage you or the radio antenna on your, I don't know, on your radio. No damage because they pick up signals, they channel signals and that's it. Other than that, is, is, is no harm done. What, uh, what damage can do to timber or what is the effect on timber? Like some of these buildings, they have expensive furniture, they have this and that and all sorts of fabrics and what it can do. Short answer, really nothing. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, the reason why it doesn't is because when you have a timber furniture, you have any, any piece of timber equipment, uh, that's dry timber and uh, the moisture content of the timber is purely driven by the ambient relative humidity. Because if the humidity increases, then some of this moisture is going to be absorbed by the, by the fibers of the timber and the timber is going to swell. So the doors in the winter time or during the autumn, they tend to stick or open more difficultly. And in the summertime, when, when there's lower relative humidity, the timber uh, again becomes, uh, becomes smaller and then no sticking occurs or it dries out. Uh, the magnetic DPC by as an indirect effect because it will remove the moisture of, from the walls or it will, it will open the door for the moisture to go back lower itself from the walls. It will normalize the internal relative humidity of the building. So if you have 80-85% relative humidity, quite often it actually drops by a few points, maybe 70-75 depending on how the environment is. And as a result, it will take the timber out of the danger zone because when you have a very, very evaporating wall surface, which is very, very damp, it tends to push the timber, the relative humidity increases and it, it will tend, tends to push the timber above 80 degrees, 80% 80, 80 relative humidity when it becomes liable to wet rot or dry rot. And by normal, normalizing the air's relative humidity, it will take the timber out of the danger zone. So it has an, uh, an indirect positive effect if you wish. It cannot overdry the timber because it will only affect the capillary moisture from the walls. It cannot actually, it doesn't deal with, um, with um, atmospheric humidity and overall doesn't have any negative effect. Other, next question would be, are there any negative effects of this system onto the building fabric? For example, we have a 500 or 1000 year old church, listed grade one listed or grade A, uh, A listed, is any potential negative effect? And the short answer is we haven't found anything. There's none of the other which, are, are, of which we would be aware of. Again, it's a passive antenna system and that's how much damage you can do to the building, none. Any failures, any limitations of these systems? Uh, based on our experience, they have worked 100% of the time. The only complications occurred where they were coming from other sources. For example, if you have a, a hidden leak in the building fabric, so this system is trying to actually to clear the wall, uh, move the water out of the walls, but the, wall, the, wall, the water still keeps coming from a hidden source, then you have an apparent non-workability. These are only localized patchy spots in the building. Other than that, no, we haven't found any non-workable technology. Um, 
what we have found in certain cases, one, the wool has been uh, dried out, applying the wrong type of plaster, for example, a gypsum plaster, especially if the gypsum is skinned, uh, and closing of the pores of the building, especially if the underlying plaster is a lime plaster, which is very, very salty. We had cases that this have been done without us being notified, and then the gypsum closed the, the salts, the hygroscopic salts into the fabric, and this salt started migrating into the gypsum and created damp patches on the gypsum. But this is, again, it's a failure of the plastering technology. This shouldn't have been happened. Other than that, there were no really failure cases. Uh, the only problem what we found, or the only problems which were where we get apparent complaints about this system, is incompetent renovation. Renovation in itself, what type of materials you use, keep it breathable, what type of lime and so on, that's a whole completely different technology. Um, that's kind of which follows after the building fabric have been dried out. Um, we respectfully ask to be informed when some of this replastering is going to occur so we can basically catch some of the potential flubs in the building and we have done that successfully a number of times. However, there were certain cases when these, we haven't caught these because we haven't been informed. However, as a generic rule, all the complications which generally occur are done are uh, because of the incorrect or incompetent plastering work done using wrong materials, wrong technologies on old salty wall surfaces. And pretty much every failure or every complication is, because there's no failure on the part of the unit, but every complication can be attributed to salts, uh, to the incorrect handling or management of salts. How this system combines, how uh, the system relates to other conservation techniques? How does it kind of mingles, mixes with other things like breathability, uh, lime plasters and everything else. The short answer is it matches perfectly. It blends in very, very well. Conservation professionals who try these systems, they love them. They keep recommending them. Um, so everything what you know about conservation, it's valid and it's true. You stick to breathable materials. Based on our experience, what we have found, the role of salts is a significantly underestimated uh, area. A lot of conservation professionals, though they know about the effect of salts, uh, they do not know the extent and the extent of damage salts can do in a building. Uh, we went through a massive learning curve on this and because we monitor every building where a magnetic DPC is fit for anywhere between one to four years depending on the size, the complexity of the project, uh, we have a tremendous experience and this which by the way I do not want to boast about this but puts us in a very very unique position in the UK because I'm not aware of any company taking gravimetric measurements from so many buildings and monitoring moisture movement in a building for so long. We take a building, we do an initial survey and then we fit the system, we do other things which needs to be done or recommend other things which needs to be done and then we monitor the building anywhere between one to four years and uh, we come back every 6 or 12 months. Typically, our residential building is monitored between 1 to 2 years. Larger commercial buildings can be monitored 3 to 4 years if need to be done. And, and we have collected a lot of data, a lot of practical data. Uh, some of these can be described, can be found in, in, in books and textbooks. Some of them are not even highlighted or described. And we found some kind of unique uh, information, quite uh, interesting information, which we are very, very happy to discuss with any conservation professional, any conservation architect. We are happy to come out to see any building and generally share our experience and knowledge with anyone out there. So how does it relate to other conservation practices? It mixes very, very well. You can use it with lime plaster. Generally speaking, it makes life much, much simpler because Without this system, you uh, typically conservation professionals, they have done a lot of work. They start actually messing with drainage, start, uh, start messing with, with other factors in order to try to improve and control rising them. This cuts through all the complexities, very, very simple. It will solve the problem. However, 
in many many cases you don't even know you don't even need to do all these things and put the drainage in just for the sake of having it in to mitigate certain things because it's not needed it becomes redundant this kind of cuts through the chase solves the problem and if the moisture is not coming up why do you want to channel uh, channel, channel the things away especially if there's very very uh, the drainage is not a significant problem or the soil is not very very damp as such i'm not telling you not to do this i'm not talking about about uh, against the drainage or against any any of the conservation measures but generally speaking this unit simplifies a lot of things and make it makes it very very simple and in one word it works very very well with conservation with cons existing conservation technologies and ex existing conservation concepts I think I'm going to finish here. There's a lot more things to be said about conservation and about moisture movement and about what this system can do and what we have discovered. I will probably do some other videos and we'll, we'll leave it for another day. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to this very, very long video. I hope very much that I clarify some of the misunderstandings uh, which have been surrounding these systems. Uh, partially aquapole systems, but they are not they are not the only system available. Um, uh, this is how our systems work, by the way. Uh, I'm not talking about other systems and hope some of these myths have been dispelled and I'm we are really open to any conversation. We are really happy to help anyone to discuss anyone to share the knowledge. So if any of any of you guys have any questions, please follow us on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. We are going to, uh, to post a lot of more, a lot of these videos. If you have any questions, ask us and we are going to actually answer directly or, or create some, some additional videos potentially with additional data. Thank you very much again for listening to this. Um, wishing you a, a good day and, See you next time.